My name is Lance Yeh, and today I'll be giving a presentation on the global impact and global response regarding atrial fibrillation. So a little bit about me, I'm currently a rising senior at Troy High School in Fullerton, California, and I've been on my school's varsity tennis team since freshman year, and I'm currently our varsity team captain. I play the violin for my church as well as compete outside of school, and I'm president of my school's botanical club where we work on plant studies while maintaining and expanding Troy's outdoor classroom. Last summer, I was a research internship under Johnson & Johnson's medical device company, Biosense Webster. Biosense specializes in diagnosing and treating heart rhythm disorders through biomedical technologies. And during my time, I was able to work with clinical specialists to research largely prevalent heart rhythm disorders, such as atrial fibrillation, and research into available and future competitive biomedical technologies in the ablation diagnostic catheter space. This summer, I'm a technical and research intern under Abbott's cardiac rhythm management team, and during my time, I am performing research into Abbott's biomedical technologies, specifically ICDs, pacemakers, and leads, also getting hands-on hands -on experience testing patient pacemakers, ICDs, and observing implantation, extractions, and ablations. And in the future, I want to study BME with a focus on global health. So before we begin, we need to know what is atrial fibrillation. To put it simply, atrial fibrillation, or AFib, is the most common type of cardiac arrhythmia or abnormal heart rhythm. During AFib, the atria of the heart beat rapidly or in an uncontrolled manner. And AFib is a condition that interrupts the normal flow of the heart's electrical system, which then leads to an abnormal heart rhythm, and this can be typically reflected by an EKG. Here we can see an example of that in the orange, where we can see a normal heart rhythm, and here in the gray, we can see an abnormal heart rhythm. These episodes of abnormality can be occasional and usually start that way, but can become persistent over time. So what causes AFib? Here, I've divided the causes into two categories. One is non-modifiable, and the other is modifiable. So in the non-modifiable section, we have uh, underlying things such as heart disease, family history, and age. And while the modifiable reasons have a lot to do with lifestyle. And so things that include caffeine consumption, sleep apnea, stress, smoking, alcohol consumption, and obesity. So eventually, AFib can lead to a variety of symptoms, uh, including fatigue, heart palpitations, difficulty exercising, shortness of breath, anxiety, chest pain, and dizziness. But uh, the most important thing to uh, digress is that AFib is a progressive disease, and one in five patients will progress from proximal or occasional AFib to persistent AFib in a single year. Stroke is a serious complication of AFib that can lead to long-term disability and mortality. Nearly one-third of all strokes caused by AFib and nearly 35% of people with AFib will have a stroke. So in the context of global health, we can see that 33 million people worldwide are affected by AFib and one in four adults over the age of 40 at risk, are at risk of AFib. And a look into the future, if we look on year-on-year -year data from the US, we can see that with the current lifestyle of many people, the amount of people diagnosed with AFib is expected to rise to 12.1 million in the US alone within the next eight years. Okay, so now we should compare global responses. So in comparing global responses, we can see that in developed or high income countries, there is easy or substantial access to EKGs, monitors, and diagnostic options to identify, to identify patients with AFib. There's also access to device treatment options, such as ICDs and pacemakers, coupled with medication to counteract symptoms of AFib. And there's also access to catheter ablations, which have the possibility to effectively get rid of AFib and its symptoms. Now, in contrast to that, we see that in developing or low-income countries, there's little to no access to diagnostic options, little to no device treatment options, and little to no treatment options besides medication. And so looking at the advantage of high-income countries, we can look a little bit closer at the treatment device options, such as pacemakers and ICDs. But even in developed countries, such as in the US, they come with some complications. Devices are usually accompanied by leads, and these leads are implanted around and inside of the heart to mimic the contraction of a healthy heart. And this is to manage AFib symptoms. These leads can be fractured, infected, or be infect ineffective, depending on the doctor. Furthermore, pacemakers and ICDs don't even solve the underlying problem, which is AFib. However, we can see that there's a general technological growth across the board as companies like Abbott and Boston Scientific are developing leadless pacemakers, which effectively get rid of that chance for infection or ineffectiveness. So comparing treatment nuances in ablation and medication, if we look a little bit closer at the most effective treatment options between low and high income countries, the most effective treatments would be catheter ablations and medication. So catheter ablations is a form of treatment in which electrophysiologists would insert catheters into a patient's heart 
and then they would burn or freeze nerves that are causing AFib. This procedure has a success rate of up to 88%, and patients receiving catheter ablations have been shown up to 73% more likely to be symptom-free compared to drugs. However, looking at developing or low-income countries, which most, if not all, catheter ablation treatments have none, we see that they need to resort to medication. However, about 50% of AFib patients do not respond to or cannot even tolerate medications and need to deal with the side effects. This ultimately leads to a higher risk of persistent AFib, lower quality of life, and higher risk of strokes. Furthermore, medication does not have the ability to resolve AFib unlike ablation. However, even with the large discrepancy in effectiveness between ablation and medication, the actual diagnosis of AFib is troublesome. Even in developed countries, um, we see that 15 to 30% of patients don't feel symptoms. And this causes doctors to discover patients with AFib purely by accident or not, by, or not discovering AFib at all because of the sporadic nature. And in the event of a diagnosis, only 5% of AFib patients are referred for catheter ablations, while the other 95% seek ineffective treatment options like medication. So we see that there's an, still an inefficient response in not only developing countries, but also developed countries as well. So what needs to change? The biggest and most important thing is to increase awareness and education. I'm sure this is the first time many of you have heard of atrial fibrillation, and by increasing awareness, we can prevent the mistreatment, undertreatment, and underdiagnosis of AFib worldwide by sparking changes in lifestyle or by letting people know what treatment options are effective. The second is increasing availability of treatment. Like I mentioned before, there is a lack of effective treatment in developing countries, as well as a lack of workforce, and increasing the availability of treatment could counteract the AFib epidemic. Lastly, there needs to be a growth in technology, whether it's in medication, pacemakers, ITDs, or catheters, we need to eventually create an effective, cheap, and available solution to AFib. Okay, so hopefully you've learned a little bit more about AFib. Here are my references in case you wanna know more. And before I conclude, I would like to first give a big thank you to the organizers of the GHLC for giving me the opportunity to present. I'd also like to thank my mentors for helping me get exposed to the information surrounding AFib. And thank you to the audience for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me through my email. Thank you. Mm.